Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> um, so I, I, I watched it again on Monday, the movie, uh, after having seen it at the Cannes Festival, and uh, it's, uh, it was no less, you know, shocking <laughs> seeing it another time. Uh, and what struck me this time is that what you were trying to do with this movie that is finding a new way of depicting events that we are all in some ways too familiar with, um, what you're trying to do is kind of bring it into the present tense in a way. Um, but that was just something that struck me. I, I, I wonder if you could just start by talking about what your goals were uh, with, with this, the way you chose to represent the movie, to represent uh, the events. Um, so I, I, I usually say that uh, I, the, the point of origin of the film was when I read about the uh, the Zonder Commandos, actually not about them, but the, their texts, the uh, the uh, 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 manuscripts by the members of the Zonder Commando, the crematorium workers, uh, and uh, these texts were found after the war. Although we know a lot of texts were not found that were written by them, but some were found, and and uh, uh, these texts took me as a reader into the heart of the of the crematorium the heart of the extermination machine uh, i never um, i never really understood uh, how you know i tried but i d never understood why um, you know what the process within uh, the holocaust was meaning what the individual what what the individual would would feel you know, I think. Uh, my assumption was there must have been, uh, you know, a great force, you know, pushing the individual into a situation from which there's no, um, uh, there's no not a lot of possibility of of, of of seeing and perceiving the outside. We're we're caught in a in a world without l a lot of information and uh, and a lot of a um, uh, lot of a lot of information on the on the, the moment that's about to happen so this sort of um, uh, d d being plunged in, in 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 that so i wanted to i think talk about the individual experience you know uh, um, uh, Imre Kettis, the hungarian um, uh, writer, when he wrote uh, uh, his masterpiece on uh, on his, you know, his, his life when he was deported to Auschwitz, in the in the final chapter of the book, uh, you know, he comes back to Budapest at the after being liberated from Auschwitz, uh, maybe not from Auschwitz, but uh, from other camp, but he he. Uh, he definitely went to uh, the, 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 uh, you know to deportation and and some some d different camps. But he came back, and on uh, in, in the public transportation, someone would ask him what hell was like, uh, what what was it like in hell, and he, he said that he doesn't. He, he says he doesn't know about hell. He he just knows about you know one one step before another. And this step uh, before, uh, you know, after another one. So it's 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 just that what what is the process of what is the experience and the of the individual, and and I wanted to recreate something very visceral, so that the audience uh, can relate in a more um, intuitive manner to the limitations of the human experience in the concentration camp, the extermination process. And not having this kind of external standpoint that was um, established uh, in the post-war, uh, you know, common uh, common corpus or common uh, common way of thinking, this sort of external point of view, distantiated point of view, uh, as if we, you know, people inside were should should have known or should have seen. Uh, so it's if, you know I wanted to uh, I wanted to experiment whether cinema could uh, could take the viewer on a visceral journey in the 
in the co- in the concentration camp, make the making this portrait of a man uh, that would be the measure of everything, you know, and not f- frontally showing uh, the horror. Uh, so that's that that was my premise, and that was my um, my goal. I I mean, I think what happens by taking the individual perspective as opposed to the, the big picture as if one could really have a big picture of these events. Um, what the individual perspective does is it kind of restores a difficulty to understanding the Holocaust. Um, I mean, you keep a lot of things in the background that other films might put in the, you know, you, you get a whole shot of everything going on and, and, and people being killed, but you really keep on the individual perspective, so you have to kind of struggle <laughs> to understand visually what's going on. And I feel like that is part of a way of making it difficult again to comprehend everything. Yeah, being lost is part of the experience. Yeah. Uh, whereas, you know, Holocaust films, the usual Holocaust film, you know, making dramatic, you know, historical drama out of, uh, out of this um, actually present a sort of, uh, um, how do you say that sort of um, uh, combination or universe of different point of views? I, I, I in, in this film, I say there's only one point of view. That's your point of view. You know, when you're caught in the in the middle of it. Uh, Gaza, at, at playing the individual that we're talking about. Uh, I mean, how did you? I mean, how do you get in, into that sign of sort of mindset? And what ideas of your own did you bring? Because you were also. I mean, in, in addition to being an actor, you've a published poet who have written, you know, an extensive body of work writing about um, the subject. So I'm just curious what perspective you brought. Well, um, I myself had a lot of reservations, uh, you know, to make another movie on, on the subject matter. I was extremely frustrated with the genre, um, and it was a very pleasant surprise uh, finishing the script that that uh, I it was very successfully it was a very delicate uh, line you know to to not to fall into kitsch and sentimentalism which usually the the case of of movies on 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 this issue but also not going into (laughs) You know, documentarism or, or or some sort of a you know too dry treatment um, of of the event, and so I I believed in the movie. I I was so relieved finishing the script to see that this is not your regular confessional point of view, that there is no you know an, an another movie that trades with optimism and somehow tries to seduce the viewer into uh, by a false comfort so my my point of departure was uh, that that i really believe that if we admit the, the the holocaust on its own terms into our hearts and minds it will shatter a whole a lot of our assumptions, silly and unexamined uh, assumptions that we carry from the past about the nature of humanity. So th- th- the, th- the what and the how of, of Auschwitz turns everything inside out. That's, that's at least for me, it, it, it did. These extermination camps, um, you know the gassing and the burning of uh, as much as ten thousand people each day is it, just c- has such a negative, heavy transcendence to it that I- nothing. I- it really challenges everything. To me, it 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 br- brings everything in, into question transforms uh, the way I, I saw the world. And I- what I expected, if anyone would dare to make a movie you know, on the subject matter, is not to dare to try to explain or understand what happened, but to eliminate the distance between the viewer and the screen, 
and just bring in the person really as much as art can into the moment, the here and now of the zone der Kommando workers reality. And what, how did I prepare for this role? I, I, I don't think my preparation started at the time when I received the script. Uh, I really felt like in some ways I was cut out for this role from, you know, a m from a much earlier point. And um, a lot of my aspects, I don't want to bore you with, you know, stages of my life from early childhood on, but a lot of my, a lot of aspects of my life, I, I think, uh, came into fruition to, to bring Saul alive. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm also just curious how you thought through, I, I mean, I guess there's always this question of people feel differently about art and the representation of the Holocaust. Um, I guess one argument is that art can never represent the Holocaust because how could you represent it? But the flip side is we need art in order to th think it through and feel it through. So, I mean, I, don't, I wonder how for each of you, you know, actually making this movie and uh, how that helped you, you know, think about those ideas and, and feelings. I think I let Giza start because he always says not very intelligent things, so I don't have to say <laughs> them in a uh, no seriously directing already in a more <laughs> in a less intelligent way. So I, I, I'll do that if you promise that we switch roles after a while, <laughs> so I can say something silly as well. Um, s so uh, I'm gonna be very honest with you because I'm, uh, I don't know, I'm sick of and sick and tired of this whole, I think it's way old school and uh, just, just past this whole discourse of re non-representability and all, all. look, th th the Holocaust, the quantum of suffering and, and whatever was present at the evil um, at Auschwitz, it's obviously, you know, excruciating. But come on, I mean, we, we've been around on this planet and, and cruelty and death and dying uh, was always around. And, and, and who is the person, what sort of a censor or grand, the grand inquisitor can just simply tell us like what to represent and what not? It's ridiculous. This, uh, I, I understand the, 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 you know, it's, the question is legitimate, but how can you single out the Holocaust? Wasn't there terrible, things and barbaric things done in history that was painted about and written about and all of this sudden, right, in the middle of 20th century, stop, you can't represent anymore. Uh, it makes no sense to me. I understand the prob how problematic it is. I understand that you have to create a new language to it and you have to do it ex nihilo. I totally get it. But the prohibition, I, I, don't, I don't believe in taboos when it comes to art. And besides of that, this whole argument, it's somewhat confused because on the one it says you're incapable, you can't do it. But they also try to come from the moral angle and say, well, it might be, you, you can, might do it, but you sh you're not allowed to do it. You know, it's, so I, I think that, and the people who are saying this, for God's sake, and I, heads up for Claude Lanzmann, I, seriously, I, one of the great masterpieces, groundbreaking, but if you really take a close look at Shoah, there is like at least a half an hour representation in that movie too. He, the, the text is saying I went left and right and the camera goes left and right in Shoah. So let's not be so absolutist and purist on, on, on this issue. The question is really how it is done. That's the question and, and I think Laszlo found the language, something that hasn't been done. This, especially the aspect of the zone der Kommando, I, I, I think it's a blind spot of Holocaust cinema besides uh, Tim Blake Nelson's gray zone, which lost me in the third minute when someone is talking with American accented English right in Auschwitz, which was like, there was about 18 languages in Auschwitz, except one, English. <laughs> it wasn't even liberated by the Americans, right? So. At least it's, we should have done it in Bergen Basin that was liberated by the English or some other, but it, it's really like this Hawaii type of thing, right? In, it's just, so in any way, it was a well-meaning attempt, and, but I, th I thought that it did not 
communicate the, the, the experience that Laszlo had in mind? Uh, I think it's really a question of how you do it. The, I, I, I think also Lanzmann, uh, when he he said things about you know not be having the right to go here and there, I think he uh, he wanted to uh, to to say that there's responsibility when you uh, when you approach such a subject. Um, but uh, but here's a fiction, and you know it did. Um, you know, Lanzmann found it good, and uh, and although it's a fiction, you know, but he, he, I think I was guided by a preoccupation of of not not necessarily the intellectual preoccupation, but the fact that uh, we must speak of the dead and the dying in a respectful manner these are the, the people who are being forgotten when we keep making films of, of one kind of survival in the, in the, you know in the in the holocaust and the deportation uh trying to you know describe uh in a frontal way um what 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 was going on so i think it's yeah it's the, the issue of 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 how how responsibly you designed uh but when you when you approach it i think from when we that was our our goal is to uh, make by making the portrait of one man staying at the level of the individual uh, we would just give the reference the human reference point and from there you know going through hell uh certainly a journey but but it gives not only the infinity of the of hell that takes place, but also the the uh, the potential of the human being. So the the, the two work, uh, you know, together. I think it's important to mention that um, in Cannes, right on my left, Claude Lanzmann was sitting, and I was really scared. <laughs> and it was at the at the first the premiere, and I second screening. Second screening. He got up at the end and he hugged me and he hugged Laszlo and I think he told Laszlo, uh, "You're my son" or some something to that effect. Like so, something. right? No, something like that. Something right. like yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> and that was a huge relief, you know, because uh, again, I don't try to mock or ridicule and uh, this concern because the, again, I think most movies that I've seen watered down the issue. They they let the viewer emerge way too safe and unscarred, and if you make a movie about the Holocaust, you should really know what what is it. Yeah, this the the issue of a safe path for the viewer is something that's that's really bothering. I think, you know, when you establish in a, a very uh, you know um, uh, a long co codes a sort of. Um, the safe road for the viewer, you know, you you navigate between the good German and the bad German, and the uh, and the uh, and the, the Nazi flag and the obligatory, you know, Hitler salutes and you know all, all kinds of elements that, did, that didn't have to take place in the middle of the camp necessarily, but it is all the things that pr we project just to, uh, you know, to please the production designer or 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 uh, or also uh, you know, but in, in fact to to reassure the viewer, so that that that's. Uh, uh, I think people sometimes who make films in historical context do not feel the historical, the given historical context, but use it as a, you know, as, as a context. You know, just let's make a film that takes place in this concentration camps or that one because it's a nice dramatic value, you know, it has a nice... Uh, you know, it, it, it's a nice background, a ni nice conflictual situation, but... We don't believe in that. Qu quick question, Nick. You're, you are a film addict, I assume. Uh, right? I thought I was asking so the question. Ha have, have, you s have you seen uh, Hiroshima Mon Amour by yes, Alain Rene? Yes, I have, yes. So he, he managed to make a movie on Hiroshima without ever showing the mushroom cloud. So you it's don't true. have to get into these iconic things, you know, the swastika, the striped pajama, right, the yeah. tattoo, 
you know, the, the, the and, and that exactly, I think we in, intended to 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 do. Yeah, and 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 at the same time, you do draw on certain historical texts and and actual events. Um, that so it's grounded in that, even if you're not you know, I explaining that during, you don't have someone saying, well, it's, 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 here we are, you know, in, 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 in Auschwitz, and, and there's a rebellion about to happen. Um, could you talk a bit about some of the events that are kind of folded into the film? Uh, I mean, one of the ones that was interesting um, that I didn't know a whole lot about was the, uh, the photographs that were attempting, if you could talk about that and maybe other things that you kind of weave into the reality of the film. Yeah, one one of it, one of them was the uh, the uprising. You know, there was only one uh, armed uprising in in the history of Auschwitz that was carried out by the Sonderkommando members, who were not you know who did were not military. They were like civilians, uh, and did still did carry out the uprising. Uh, and and I th we wanted to have the uprising because. Uh, I think we wanted to uh, um, to to say that you know we're there's a context of uh, of of a s of sort of possibility of a revolt, uh, you know, something of um, uh, something going on in the Zonda Commando, whereas the main character has a, s a different kind of revolt, and it made his you know it it made the interrogation about his revolt more. You know, more acute in a sense, but also the f the f the photographs, the photos are uh, for me uh, in inseparable from from the texts of the Sonderkommando members. Four pictures were were taken uh, by the Sonderkommandos in uh, 1944 uh, at incredible, you know, um, an incredible danger. Uh, they they had to. There it was very. It wasn't very hard to find a camera among the you know the stuff from the de deported people, but it was very hard to find negative, and and to process it. So it was extremely difficult, and they and they they did it, and um, they took pictures because they thought that if uh, if the our people is being exterminated. And, and in their text, they say there will there will be no one left from the people, probably because they saw you know hundred you know hundreds of thousands being killed. But will will there be a trace of them? Will there be a you know for for the future generations? Will there be anything? That's why they wrote you know the the text, and that's why they tried to take pictures so that they can th they can smuggle down the the pictures. So I think also the, the 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 it belonged to the to the rebellion and the uh, the resistance that was was taking place within the Zonderkommando. Um, I will be having questions uh, shortly, or or we could just go into the questions now. I suppose <laughs> people seem pretty. Good. So please, yeah. The microphones. Oh, yeah, if you could just please wait for the microphone to be brought. When I came out of the theater, I was full of emotion. And then I realized upon reflection that there's very little dramatic emotion in the film from the characters. They are so beaten down and that the, 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 the use of color, the, um, the, the, the way the sound is, fill in for what would normally be these dramatic situations uh, that make it easy for the audience to, to have some sort of reaction. So I wanted to know how you um, decided to keep this tone in the film, which it's a very, very primitive emotion that we that we see. We don't see those dramatic moments, even when they they could be there. Uh, the, the, everything is flattened on that level, but the, the the landscape is quite stunning because it is in color. That you that you do get a different kind of emotional response. Um. Yeah, sometimes you in a lot of films you see the uh, the spectacle out of human suffering, especially in you know Holocaust films, and you see these weird colors, the metal colors or brown, like you see it's from different planet. It seems like fantasy, you know, fantasy or sci-fi a little bit, because the concentration camp has to be you know like a little uh, either blue or 
I don't know, brown or uh, whatever. We what we thought is this is a this is a, this is taking place here and now in the film, and it's a uh, it's a building. It happens to be a crematorium. It's uh, you know it's it's a factory uh, that's pretty recently built, and um, and uh, this is uh, we wanted to recreate a sort of. Uh, everyday life everyday life kind of you know quality to it because it was not it wasn't taking place on on a different planet and 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 it we we think that there's w- th- we 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 wanted to to have this very raw um uh feeling to the film so uh and all the documents that we read you know all the, you know all all, all the sig- signs pointed in one direction that this this was uh, uh, th- this was just a factory it happens to be a factory of death and something unprecedented and 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 something unprecedented in a moral way obviously in the heart of civilization but it's there's some some kind of simplicity there's c- some kind of simplicity it it's you know the w- the way people there's no th- 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 there's no um um there's no you know drama all the time there are people are being killed where when there's no ap- apparent apparent drama you know in a way you know in silence or or almost silence or almost unknown to the, to the world oh y- yeah 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 but we we wanted to keep all the you know and and for the Zondar commando we wanted to keep everything pretty low key because we these people were are in a traumatic situation, post-traumatic situation. They are, uh, you know, b- burning hun- hundreds, thousands of bodies per day. Sometimes burning their own families. Uh, how, you know, there's they're locked in. You know, how how do you recreate this kind of, uh, you know, uh, closed, closed world that they they the the, uh, the shield that they have. So I I um, I really w- try to work with the actors so to uh, to to reach a state in which they were not trying to act, you know, certain emotions or or uh, or be very responsive to uh, you know to things because they 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 had to be on a different frequency, and all the testimonies and even in their writings when they write they say we're like you we just we are like robots you know we uh, i just wanted to add a comment to that that it's interesting you mentioned how unemotional the zombie like you know state of mind did the zombie commander workers were but I- in a very intense symmetry the same is true about the perpetrators and that's what uh, i think hannah arendt pointed out and that's why i call Auschwitz in some ways like th- like a, a archetype of modernity because killing another person, homicide, historically speaking, was always done with passion. And here you have this new brand of killers who are doing it removed from the actual act. They are just putting the Zyklon B in. They are on a different level. And the I desk... In the pits is different. Hmm? In the pits, by the pits, is different. Right. But yeah, when when the normal uh, yes, and and so there is this, you know, this whole notion of the, the cog in the machine, the apparatchik, the desk killer, who is here. You have it, someone who is committing, you know, genocide on a gigantic scale, does it in a bored, indifferential way and does not as, ac- accept responsibility for it. It's a new development. You, you didn't have this kind of killers beforehand. You know, this, so, so it's interesting just like to point out that that type of a coldness is also on the other side. And, yeah, and to try to relieve the troops from the, you know, the, 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 the weight of the killings, you know, that, that was something that had to be done, a job that had to be done, but we shouldn't put the troops too right. much because it would, it just uh, uh, p- troubles the troops too, too much. 
I, I just want to quickly mention that this is your de debut feature, but you actually directed a short film that's almost a kind of precursor to this film. Um, if, if you could talk a bit about that, maybe just quickly. Yeah, but people probably haven't seen the f short yeah, film. Well I, 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 it's th I, I d we did it with a cinematographer and sound designer and production designer try to... Uh, um, uh, we, sh we made three short films together and, and in all of them we tried to, uh, to tell stories in an organic way, uh, in situations uh you know leaving to the viewer the possibility of 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 using their imagination of um of of having a se you know a secret and in in in, the, in this film so it's not it's at the beginning you don't necessarily know what the end you know what the end you know i i believe in this kind of cinema i you know i'm i i probably more i'm more sensitive to it to uh to because for me cinema has a sort of mystery and ha must have some kind of mystery for uh, because because we have to take the viewer on a journey. Any questions over there? Yeah. Thank you for the film. I was wondering if there were any reactions from any survivors of the Holocaust to your film. Um, well, I don't. Um, uh, there were reactions. They did a lot. Um, the ones that are really uh, interesting for me, people who didn't want to see the film because they w thought they would be, uh, um, you know, uh, troubled by it or scared. Actually, the and and who eventually saw it thanked me uh, because they, they it wasn't the film that they expected, uh, and I'm. Uh, I f I think that I you know you know in the process I could give a voice to people who couldn't necessarily express some things you know about maybe not an entire experience but something hinting at something in there that's not that's not easy to commu communicate and cinema can do it I think I'm not saying I I succeeded but I tried to uh, communicate something of the, the, that kind of uh, level. Um, just would add that um, I think there's a gratefulness from the survivors I spoke with because there is this growing uh, anxiety that that with with passing the survivors, you know, um, they were or they are the living link to this event, and you know history is taking. Holocaust back from the window, so to speak, and there is this worry of t about the younger generations. Will they really understand the significance of it? And I don't think, talking in Europe at least in America, Holocaust denial is a real danger, but Holocaust ignorance is. And there are surveys that are really scary. Uh, people have this knee-jerk reaction: is like, "Oh, I know it. Come on, it's like," <laughs> but. Really, they they don't know it in in depth, and I'm not, you know, it's it's just again, we are not talking about any sort of parochial issue here. This is not a Jewish question. This is, a, it is at least as much a Christian question, for God's sake. And if I want to be provocative, I would even say go that far. That I think Christianity has failed the greatest test since its origin by abandoning the Jews uh, nowhere else but in the heart of Europe and if in 1935 the leaders of the church or half of them would have you know just speak up and said we are not Aryans we are Jews in spirit you can't do that I mean we have teachings we have gospel we have, this is just not then the whole plan would have collapsed. Uh, I think maybe we could just <coughs> have maybe one more question, if, if we could, uh, uh, maybe from this part of the room, yeah, in the center. If you could make sure to wait for the mic. So my, qu <coughs> my question is for uh, Laszlo. Um, Laszlo, can you uh, talk to us about the process or the considerations that you went through in um, casting uh, Giza for the role of uh, Saul Oslander. I mean, the haunting image that's left with me is of the eyes and the kind of the vacuous 
look, but there must have been a whole lot more process that went on behind that. And I'm particularly intrigued to know the answer in light of what uh, Giza has already said about uh, about his uh, his life and coming to this role. Yes, um, I uh, the first idea was to cast um, uh, an established actor uh, in Europe. Uh, we had several options, and uh, but in the f you know it took us years and years to uh, to get the ma the film financed and con you know con try to convince people in Europe to finance the film. Uh, well, it wasn't easy, and we we I think we failed apart from the Hungarians who who the film fund uh, supported the film, but we couldn't make it as a co-production. And uh, in the process, you know, uh, I had the time to think and talk with a lot of people, the casting director, uh, uh, the, pr the producer who was here, um, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the cinematographer. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm from a sort of, you know, we can call the Bela Star School of Filmmaking. Um, that's um, that's uh, about not only about craziness. It's also about um, you know the importance of casting, and and mixing uh, you know non-professionals and professionals or or uh, less trained professionals and professionals. So uh, so I I wanted you know to have believable faces in the film, and I I knew I wanted to different you know languages. So the the, the whole casting was pretty you know hu a huge process in the european process with many countries involved but i uh, for the main part uh actually there was some point when i i i thought of geza as as this guy has a good face you know and and <laughs> an interesting character usually this that's the point of you know the starting point Let's ask him to do a monologue. So I asked him to send me a monologue, and he told me a tale, and it was very convincing. We liked it, and we made him come. I, I convinced my producer to uh, to uh, to get get him to Budapest because he lives in New York, and um, and then uh, he came, and we auditioned him for the second role, Abraham, uh, because I didn't have the, you know this. Th there's no. Epiphany at this moment about you know the ma ma him being the main character. And it's also very scary to you know for a first time filmmaker to have you know uh, not an established actor. So he came, and in the process of the editions, he also did uh, had to had to switch roles and and do so. And and we looked at uh, each other with the casting director and so. On. The you know, there mi might be something more here than the, you know, just uh, something different actually, and um, and and actually we found that he, you know, he was, he had something of this of the stubborn quality of the main qua character, the the obsessive um, quality of him, this um, this very physical, the physical and intellectual man at the same time. Well, not intellectual, mental. Let's say mental. You know, and uh, and so he he um, we asked him to uh, he we we asked him back. We let him go, and then I had to convince you know I had to convince my producer to uh, to get him another plane ticket. So we he came back to Budapest and 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 said, okay, we're not going with any other actor. We 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 know it's risky. We know it's uh, uh, you know everything is on his face. But you know, the interesting thing is that um, uh, he is very expressive in life on his face, uh, but not in n not necessarily in the movie. You know, it's different. But at the same time, it's it's a micro, you know, the micro movements. Actually, the possibility of him being, you know, having all these layers, we feel that as a, as an audience. I think that he's he has the layers. So. Yeah. Do you want to add something? Is that, um, is that accurate? Um, <laughs> my, my, my it's a pi it's a pity that you don't know my mother-in-law. <laughs> she 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 would agree with you on the stubborn part. Um, um, 
is the, is, was this the last question? Yeah, we should, okay, we should be I, wrapping I, up I a little really bit. I just really wanted to, like, I made the resolution this morning because this is the last, uh, the, the f for us, appearance in this festival. We are, you know, we are painting very dark colors, obviously, and I just wanted to finish up with a joke, and I think it relates to, to, to all this. Is the two Jews meet, and, um, you know, they discuss the, what's going on in the world, and then one is asking the other, um, are you an optimist or are you a pessimist? And the one says, I'm an optimist, definitely an optimist. He says, well, if you're such a big optimist, then why, are, why, why do you look so miserable? <laughs> and the other one says, well, you think it's such an easy thing to be optimist nowadays? <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, and on that note, <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>